On March 8th, 1994, Trent Reznor's self-destructive auditory monster was unleashed upon the world. Nine Inch Nails, The Downward Spiral is now 30 years old. It's one of my favorite albums of all time, so I'll tell my story with it. In 2007, I was at Hard Rock Cafe in Philadelphia. On one of the TVs was the music video for Head Like a Hole. The big thing that caught my attention was the ending, with Trent tangled in chords and spinning around. I liked this and wanted to hear the band with my full undivided attention. I'd seen the name Nine Inch Nails on separators in music stores and thought it was an interesting name for a band. Lo and behold, I was given a CD playlist with Burn on it. Burn was on the Natural Born Killer soundtrack, it was also on the deluxe edition of The Downward Spiral. The song had angst, low register bass synths, hateful lyrics, and fast sections that were ideal for destroying everything in sight. Yes! Give me more of this. At the time, the new album was Year Zero. Year Zero was the first Nine Inch Nails album I ever bought. And after listening to Burn over and over that summer and getting to hear this new album, I was bored to death. The testosterone and anger was nowhere to be found. I thought Year Zero was quiet, subdued, and far removed from what I'd heard. I'd eventually come around to Year Zero, but that was another story. Um, thankfully I wasn't deterred, and I wanted to give the band another chance. Burn came from the Downward Spiral Deluxe Edition, so logic led me to try the Downward Spiral. First of all, I thought the song titles were interesting. I also couldn't pin down what was supposed to be on the cover. Mr. Self Distraught opened with the THX 1138 sample, and then the music kicked in. There it was, the sound I was after. But I still had an entire album to go through. Even at 11 years old, I noticed things like sound effects moving across the stereo field, quiet things being brought into the foreground without a lot of attention being brought to them, tracks bleeding into other tracks, and unconventional ways of crafting the songs. I was drawn to it all. But it also gave me nightmares. By that point, I'd only been accustomed to the likes of Queen, Kiss, and ACDC. I wasn't used to hearing music this honest or dark. Yet. I heard the Downward Spiral motif in my sleep. Even some of the remixes on the second disc were mentally jarring. That Coil remix for the title track? That scared the shit out of me. Typically some of the best music is the kind that you have to unravel over time to understand it, and I let it unravel. This music didn't come from my era. I wasn't even alive when it came out, but I've always been of the mindset that I don't care how old or new something is as long as it's good. The Downward Spiral became my soundtrack that year. Certain family members got pissed off to a comically obsessive level with some of the lyrics, and that just pushed me more towards the band. Then a guitar teacher told me that Trent does a lot of the music by himself in the studio. Yeah, he said. Trent may sometimes have people help him, but that's him writing and performing a lot of it. I asked if it was possible for me to make a whole song by myself, to which I was told about Audacity and how to use it. Years later, tons of production tricks used by Trent are things that I try to do with my own music. With years of experience, not to mention technology evolving, I can do those things better and easier at 28 than I could at 11. But that all started when I was told what I was told by my guitar teacher. Thank you, Mr. Pilgrim. The album made me a fan, and in a couple short years I was able to collect most of the Halos. At one time, I came close to owning them all. Admittedly though, some of the remixes and b-sides tend to be boring, repetitive, and sometimes just don't work. But when they do work, they kill on sight. Further down the spiral showed me that a remix album could be its own independent listening experience. A remix album could be more than just adding the vocals to a popular song over a club beat. These songs were ripped apart, reconstructed, shapeshifted, manipulated, and completely reinterpreted. That Coil remix that I mentioned earlier, the downward spiral at the bottom, many, many, many evening walks were spent with that in the headphones. To this day, I'll try to notice things that I haven't before, or I'll wonder how they got some of the sounds. Of course, I'd also come to love a lot of the other albums, especially the Fragile and the Broken EP. Each Nine Inch Nails album commands a different type of listening experience, so people have different favorite albums for different reasons. The Downward Spiral was the album that sent the band into the stratosphere. Tons of other bands wanted to be like them. It was a perfect album for its time, and I think that there's nothing about it that sounds dated. In a way, it exists in its own vacuum. There are a few albums that I can think of where you can say that for, and The Downward Spiral is definitely one of them. 
People who were around at the time told me that Closer, the song and the music video, was the most shocking and scandalous thing at the time. I'm sure that helped the album's success. I'm sure it helped in the same way that the album being recorded in the Sharon Tate house helped, despite criticism towards Trent over the matter. 17 years later, and I still don't get tired of listening to it, there are so many different textures, sounds, and production styles that vary from song to song. The songs can fit different moods. Hurt does well when big things come to an end. A warm place can calm my nerves. Heresy and Mr. Self-Distraught make me want to smash shit. Reptile makes me grin from ear to ear. And the bridge towards the end of Closer never fails to remind me to turn the volume way up. So thank you, Nine Inch Nails, for creating soundtracks to many people's lives, including my own. And happy 30th birthday to the Downward Spiral. It looks good for its age, doesn't it? I'm sure it'll continue to look great for a long time. On a somewhat unrelated note, the Sharon Tate house was demolished after the album was finished. Trent moved operations to New Orleans, and he took the front door of the Tate house with him. The door was put on what would become Nothing Studios. Around Halloween of 2022, I was visiting family in New Orleans, and I wanted to see Nothing Studios. It hadn't been operating since 2004, but tons of great albums were recorded there. The vocals for The Great Southern Trend Kill were recorded there, Antichrist Superstar was recorded there, so was The Fragile and several other albums. Mainly, I wanted to see if the Tate door was still on the building. No. The building was remodeled and the door had been auctioned off. That door's been all over the place, and that door has seen some shit. Cult murders, iconic albums being recorded, horrible floods. Still, just walking down the street, I can imagine Trent and company must have had some relaxing breaks in between recording. 